Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the University of Houston, Victoria. Thank you to American Book Review. Thank you to both Jeffs, Jeff Jeffries. Um, uh, and thank you for, especially for those lovely introductions. Thank you to the former mayor um, for offering to host me this evening. Um, and thank all of you for being here. Um, uh, so I'm gonna read, I think, from the other side, um, maybe just a little bit. And then maybe I'm gonna read something from my new book um, because I think it's relevant given a lot of the conversations that are happening and, um, in contemporary discourse these days, um, especially given yesterday's sentencing hearing. I'm gonna read actually just this tiny little passage from, trust, or from the other side. The man I used to live with wants to know who might be expecting me. I consider whom to call, who could best handle answering the last phone call I ever make. Not my parents. They aren't expecting me. I have just moved into my new apartment and I planned to spend the night unpacking. Yesterday, my parents took me to the store to get new sheets, new towels, a new comforter for the bed. The mattress hasn't been delivered yet. Mom said, I don't think we can afford to keep setting you up all over again like this. I lie and call my good friend. She'll tell me later that she knew something was wrong. She spends the whole night driving around looking for me. The old apartment I used to share with him, my new apartment, my favorite bars downtown, ditches beside the road. He says, I'm going to rape you now. And it doesn't matter that I am on my period because he pulls my tampon out by the string and lays it beside the mattress. The police will find it later and catalog it into evidence. My blood pools on the clear plastic sheet which they will also catalog into evidence. At first, I have a body, a wild animal body I throw and thrash against his cage. I almost break a limb before he catches me in his hands. I growl and hiss and bare my teeth. But then my body is not a wild animal body. It is a human girl body. The two arms pinned across, the two legs spread a tomb. It's the mind that goes thrashing so wildly. The body remains calm. The body undresses and lays itself down. But the mind goes thrashing so wildly. The body lays itself down on a clear plastic sheet, hears but does not listen to the soup of human-like speech boiling in its ears, spilling exactly the length and the width of the room. The mind skitters safely out of reach. The body lays itself down, but does not know with precision which direction or at what point, if any, in the future it will rise and go, or even if it will be physically possible. The future having maybe splintered the body into a thousand wet shining shards. Underneath, bedrock unbuckles with the thrust of vast tectonic plates, skidding at this very moment over an ocean of white hot magma in the body's every orifice. But the mind goes thrashing. The mind goes thrashing away from the body, which does not move a muscle does not move an inch from the spot in which it is unraveling, will be unraveling, has been unraveling ever since. So that passage is at the center of the other side. It's kind of what it's all coming to. Um, I'm sure you already know much of the story. I was, when I was 21, um, I was kidnapped and raped by this man that I used to live with. He was a man I used to love. Um, but he was an abuser in more ways than just physically. He was a narcissist. He was a manipulator. He was able to do those things because he crushed my very sense of self, ground it down until there was almost nothing left. Um, and when I went to, on, to read from the other side, um, as I did after the book 
you know, as a writer, you do that. You go and tell everybody your deepest, darkest secrets and have to be okay with that. You know, it's a kind of a strange thing. But a lot of people um, kept asking me the same question over and over during the tour. And um, the question stuck with me, and I'll, I'll tell you about it in just a minute. So um, that question... Uh, has informed the next book that I'm writing. And I'm gonna read you just a little bit of the first chapter of the next book, if, if that's okay. It's kind of in progress, but I think you guys are, I trust you <laughs> to not judge me too harshly. You seem like nice people. Um, and this book is called The Reckonings. And this is an essay from it. Usually it is a woman who asks the question, always the same question, everywhere I go. She is sitting near the door in the last row of the auditorium, having spent the last hour listening to me talk about what it means to have once been kidnapped and raped by a man I loved, a man with whom I lived, a man who even before the kidnapping had already violated me in every way you might imagine if you were a man like him. Someone else in the audience asked what happened to the man who did this to me, and I explain how he got away, how he is a fugitive living in Venezuela, raising a new family. This is not the ending they expect. Now the woman has a question. She raises her hand and when I call on her, always last, she stands and speaks in a clear, assertive voice. What do you want to have happen to him, the man who did this to you? By this, I know she means not only the actual crime the man committed, but also all of the therapy, the nightmares and panic attacks, the prescribed medication and self-medication, the healing and self-harm. I mean, you probably want him dead, right? No, I think. No, I say out loud. Her expression crumples. She is confused. Everyone in the audience is confused. This isn't how it's supposed to be how the story ends. It's not the ending they want for themselves, for me. It is the ending to the story the women at the book club want too. They are sitting around a long oak dining table in the home of our gracious host, who brings food out in many courses, during each of which the wine flows freely. They ask questions, mostly bookish ones, but eventually the conversation turns to the man I lived with, to how he got away. I'd kill him for you, one says. I'd kill him on the spot, says another. These women carry guns in their purses, they have told me. They are angry enough to use them. <clears throat> Maybe it is the wine or the force of their conviction, but soon the women are saying out loud the various ways they would like to not only kill, but also dismember this man. They would cut his arms off, one at a time. They would have him pulled apart by giant trucks. Don't mess with ladies from Texas. <laughs> one brings up the story she has heard earlier in the day that a different man, a local <clears throat> man, has been convicted of the murder of a boy who was seven when the local man raped him. The boy turned eight on the day the local man burned him alive. The boy survived enough to implicate the local man as his, attack, as his attacker years later before he died. The local man was charged with capital murder, tried, convicted, and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Justice has been served, one of the women in the book club says. How is this justice? asks another. He's going to spend the next 40 years living off our taxes. He should be burned alive, the host says, the same way he tried to kill that boy. She has been quiet the entire evening, in and out of the kitchen, up and down from her chair. Now she is seated at the head of the table, looking at her hands, which twist and untwist the iron napkin she discards in the middle of her plate. What do you want to have happen to him? She asks me. The woman who asks the question sits with her back to the wall, like I do when I have the choice, or near the door in the last row of every auditorium I visit. Sometimes she is my mother's age or my age. She wears oversized sweaters, little makeup, pulls her hair back in a simple bun. She does not want attention. She has children like I do, and like I do, she sometimes struggles to love them well. She will tell me this after I am finished answering questions when I am sitting at a little table signing books. She has a story that is similar to my story in ways. 
and she doesn't even know what to feel about it anymore. Sometimes the woman is an old woman with crepe paper hands. Sometimes she is not a woman, but a man, an old man my father's age in a 10-gallon hat who tells me he was raped by an uncle when he was the age of my son. Or the person is a man young enough to be my son, if I had started much earlier, who tells me the question is for himself or for his girlfriend. They both have a story like mine, he says, and they have not yet found an ending to it. I am surprised at how many people sitting near the door in the last row of the auditorium always have a story like mine. I carry these stories with me because I don't know what else to do with them. The details may differ. If it is not the story of an abusive lover, perhaps it is a mother or a father or an uncle or a coach or a doctor. Or it is the story of a friend who has been killed by a stranger while trying to do the right thing or a woman who was shot in the back of the head while asking for help. It might be a story about the abuse of a power or authority or the slow violence of bureaucracy, of the way some people are born immune from punishment and others spend whole lifetimes being punished in ways they did nothing to deserve. In my story, there was a man I once loved very much, and because of the self-destructive way in which I loved him, I didn't want to leave him when he abused me first with his words and then with his fists. I told myself I could fix him, that this wasn't who he was, not really. I let him keep showing me who he really was until I finally believed him and left. I was 21 when that man kidnapped and raped me and tried but failed to kill me. The man got away and I got away. He is a fugitive living in Venezuela and I am a writer of books. The one I wrote before this was about him, about the day he meant to kill me, but I lived. It was not easy. Not the writing and not the living, not until I often found myself standing in front of strangers, telling them there is justice for me in standing here, in this room, alive and speaking with my own voice. It is not the ending to the story anyone expects, not even the one they want, because they want a return, a redemption, a retrieval of all I have lost for my part in the story. They want suffering for him. They want blood, guts, gore. Now that would be justice, they think. My mom tells me she wants him dead too. She has just read the book, even though I told her not to, even though she told me she wouldn't. But uh, she, like the woman sitting at the head of the table in the book club and the woman sitting near the door in the last row of the auditorium, feels unsatisfied by the story I have told about my life or more precisely, she feels unsatisfied by the ending I have told to this story, because it cannot be reconciled to all she has been told about how these things should end, that the man who did that terrible thing should suffer as much as I have suffered, and as much as she has suffered, if not more. In all of the movies she has seen, this is how it goes. The person who has done the terrible thing falls from a very tall building or is incinerated by a ball of white hot flames or is shot in the dark by police or at the very least is led away in handcuffs by police. Police. She wants an ending like that for herself, for me. I also watch these movies on occasion and I admit there is a certain satisfaction in watching Uma Thurman's Beatrix Kiddo finally kill Bill on the patio of his villa with the five-point exploding heart technique. He knows what he has done, why she has come. He does not even try to stop her. I take pleasure watching Numi Rupes as Lisbeth Salander condemn her rapist by tattooing that word into his chest. She violates him in the same ways he violated her and a few more for good measure. When Sophie Turner's Sansa Stark allows Ramsay's own dogs to eat him alive, she smiles a little, and there is something in me that smiles a little also. These men deserve this punishment, their stories have told us, and it feels good for once to see someone get what he deserves. And yet I know this is spectacle, entertainment, not actual life, though life also has its share of spectacles. I would be horrified and find I often am to see anyone actually murdered, much less tortured out of some thirst for revenge. 
The spectacle reinforces over and over a story I want to believe about the world, even though I have never yet witnessed it for myself, that everything will come out right in the end, that bad things will eventually happen to bad people, that good people will eventually receive all the blessings they deserve. Everyone gets their just desserts, the story tells me, so I can go on. But what if that doesn't happen? What if, as in my story, the person who does the terrible thing more or less gets away with it? Does that mean there is no justice to be made or had or found? What does justice look like in a situation where the crime is not intimate and personal, <coughs> but massive and public, and there is no one person to blame? What if the wrong person is blamed? What if we punish the right person, but in the course of doing so, we cause unnecessary pain? What if we ourselves feel pain by performing this duty of punishing person after person, day after day? How could we not? What does justice look like in these situations? Is justice even a real thing that any of us can achieve at all? There is a story we have each heard from birth that when someone does something bad, something bad should happen to them, and therefore, justice. This story is a very old one I've learned, older even than the law of eye for an eye we find in the Old Testament, traceable back to the pre-Babylonian period to the Code of Hammurabi, the oldest surviving record of ancient law. If a man has put out the eye of a free man, put out his eye. If he breaks the bone of a free man, break his bone. If he puts out the eye of a serf or breaks the bone of a serf, he shall pay one mina of silver. This is the Lex Talionis, the law of retaliation, written over 5,000 years ago when vengeance ran amok, when a man might steal his neighbor's cow, for instance, and the neighbor would respond by murdering that neighbor's entire family. As we tell it now, the Lex Talionis is mandate. You must put out his eye. But it was, in fact, meant to put an upper limit on vengeance, to curb what humans understood even then to be our baser instincts. Then, as now, we want to transform our suffering, to take pain we experience and change it into the satisfaction of causing pain for someone else. We watch Clint Eastwood as Josie Wales turn his grief into hatred in order to pick up a gun, and watch Ving Rhames as Marcellus Wallace turn us, an audience who has witnessed his terror and near annihilation, into accessories to all the suffering his promise of going medieval might mean. To see another suffer is pleasant, Nietzsche writes. To make another suffer is still more pleasant. He's thinking in particular of how tempting it is to imagine punishment as a kind of redemption of guilt. The word schuld means both guilt and debt in English. And one primary meaning of the word redemption was to buy that debt back. This is a trick of the mind that tells us that every injury has some equivalent of pain or sacrifice. There is, as Nietzsche points out, a strange accounting in this. A crime creates a debt, the criminal becomes a debtor, the victim his creditor, whose compensation is the particular pleasure of bearing witness to a cruel and exacting punishment. Is that justice? Would I cheer and cry and jump up and down if the man who kidnapped me were kidnapped and raped, beaten, if I could grind him down with my rage until there was almost nothing left of him? If I could watch him suffer in all the ways he made me suffer, or better yet, to cause that suffering myself. The story tells me to imagine it would feel satisfying, a release of adrenaline or perhaps the relief from it, catharsis, a cleansing. To be honest, I'm not sure what justice is supposed to feel like. There is a shut place I carry inside me. If I caused him to suffer, would that go away? I have found photographs of him on the internet that suggest he is living with a woman who has given birth to two of his children, both girls. In the photos, he is unhappy in his new life as he ever was in the one he lived with me. On vacation, he grows sullen because the trip isn't going his way, and when the family joins him in the ocean, he frowns and looks away from the camera, afraid of being recognized, perhaps, afraid of what the photograph will reveal. The older daughter, who is the same age as my son, sits on her mother's lap, the mother who is love and safety, who makes a wall with her body between the daughter and him. Does he notice who does this? He holds the baby a little above his lap and away from his body. 
At a party, he dances back and forth in front of the children and also their parents who are watching because he has an audience. And in public, he performs a version of himself who is charming, who is fun to be around, who is everything every, anyone ever wanted a person to be. Behind closed doors, he is angry and irritable, a man so fragile and insecure that he rages at anyone who does not reflect the back the version of himself he wants to see. This is why his wife and daughters look in the photographs a little hollowed out inside. I can see everything he is doing to them, everything he has already done. You probably want him dead, strangers tell me. If we know in what way society is unbalanced, we must do what we can to add weight to the lighter scale, Simone Weil once wrote. In the years since I left that man, I have fallen in love many times, made a father out of a man I met on the internet. I have created life, have written whole worlds. I have been the architect of entire moral geographies for two barely domesticated children. And I have learned to welcome the strangers who arrive at the doorstep of my soul. I've called myself a writer now more than half of my life, and during all this time I have learned that sometimes the hardest and most important work I have done has meant turning a story I couldn't tell into one that I can, and that this practice on its own is not only one of discovery, but of healing. Is justice a story about healing? Justice is blind, we are told. It is served, maybe like a severed head on a plate. It is a destination, the path to which is long and sometimes crooked and bent. The Roman emperor Nero called it justice when he threw Christians to the beasts in the Colosseum. The crowds cheered. For some, justice means sticking to the laws or enforcing them. For others, it means helping friends and harming enemies. Aristotle observed that justice, like language, is a special characteristic of humans. Plato suggested that justice is an inward grace. Might is right is another enduring view. Might meaning violence, of course, and violence being the opposite of grace. More than anything else, what I want is a reckoning, many of them, and not just for myself, not only him. I want it for the woman who asked the question and for the woman with the crepe paper hands and the man in the 10 gallon hat, for the boy who burned, for his mother who barely lived for the woman shot in the back of the head, for the man killed while running away, for his children, for the actress and the custodial worker, for the gymnast, for the art that is not made because our children are at war, for those who die alone at the end of a needle, for those who carry invisible wounds and barely survive. I want a long line of reckonings. I want the truth told back to us. I want the lies laid bare. No. I say to the woman who has asked the question from the back of the room or from against the wall or sitting at the head of the table. I don't want him dead. I want him to admit all the things he did to my face, maybe in public, and then to spend his life in service to other people's joy. She is struck silent and leans back in her seat. If there's anything I want to happen to him, it's only this. I don't want him dead. I don't even want him to suffer. More pain creates more sorrow, sometimes generations of sorrow, amplifies injustice rather than cancels it out, which is not to say there shouldn't be consequences. I want to let go of my anger and fear and pain, to let go of the hatred and enmity and spite. I want that shut place inside me to open I have already been carrying it for so long. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Hi. Why do you think you took that road of, of uh, not wanting him dead? Um, because I don't hate him. I don't, I don't actually hate anyone. And I think in order to want that, you have to hate a person to want to see them dead. Um, and I don't hate him. I don't want him to live next to me or be my neighbor. 
I'm kind of the opposite of Mr. Rogers on that. Um, please don't be my neighbor. Um, I don't want anything to do with him except, as I say, just to have this, have him admit what he did. Um, but otherwise, um, I don't think it would make me feel any differently about the situation, about what happened to me in the past, to know that he's being harmed. You know, I mean, he lives in Venezuela right now, which I don't know if you're following the news. Things aren't going so well. Um, that doesn't make me feel better. The, you know, I, in the other side, um, I write that, you know, I was also raped when I was 14. And I've learned that the person who did that um, committed suicide a number of years ago. That doesn't make me feel better. It doesn't in any way alter that trauma um, to know that he's dead. It's a thing that I carry that I'm trying to heal and that does not provide healing. It harms his family. There are people who are grieving him, his mother, maybe. So that doesn't, her pain doesn't make me feel better. Um, so it's just a thing I've thought a lot about. Probably initially, I fantasize more about killing him, but that was maybe out of self-defense. Like I, not, not like, oh, I want him dead, but just imagining, because I thought for a really long, long time that he might come for me, um, so I had to imagine, like, well, would I actually, would I actually be able to? Um, and I never found that I was able to get past more than just stopping him um, in the fantasy. Of course, not in real life, but in the fantasy. I wasn't able to follow through on that imagination. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. How do your other family? Do you have a brother? I have two sisters. How do they feel? How do they feel about this? Um, I think they're probably with my mom. They want him dead. Um, and, but I don't actually, it's not, it's not about them. They would like it to be about them, but it's not about them. Um, why do you ask? Because I have a very close friend whose sister was raped and murdered. Mm. He said, about the time. Yeah. And he went to the execution. And another man that was at the execution said, they had to do, it take four or five people to keep him from trying to get to that way. Yeah. So that's one thing that has stuck with me. In a lot of stories that I have read about executions, for instance, where someone had been murdered and, and the person who committed the crime is caught, you know, sentenced to death, is executed, and people go and see the execution. Um, it doesn't make them feel better. Like it doesn't cause any healing. And, and what happens with far more frequency is that people feel worse. Um, that there's a, it takes more from the world. Um, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination suggesting that these people should be forgiven. I'm not saying that. Um, but for me, that harm isn't justice. That's vengeance. That's us. Our hatred that satisfies our hatred, but doesn't satisfy the part of us that's injured, from which that hatred comes. Right. Oh, I want to go over here and then. Yeah. Any time that you're looking at him, what did it take for you? Oh, what was the final straw? I had already been fantasizing about leaving him for a while. And I was, I had just graduated college and I was applying to grad schools and, and, and I had been trying to figure out a way, like, can I, if I got accepted to a grad school, could I go and just him not come? Um, and he was not gonna allow that. Um, by some coincidence, I did not get into grad school the first time I applied because I was not that great of a writer. Um, then it got better, maybe. Um, but um, but so that that was the out that I had imagined, and I realized then, like, oh, it's not going to be that easy. I just have to do this thing that's really hard. And I think we, at the very end, we had had an argument for many days that had resulted in him being physically 
harmful to me. Um, and I just decided it just broke the last thing in me. Um, and I realized like, if I don't leave, I'm going to die. And if I leave, I might die, but this is the only chance I have. So I think I tricked him into thinking that I was, um, going to just hang out with my, stay with my family for a couple of days. Um, and, and then just didn't come back. And then he sort of lost his mind and started plotting how he was going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have several citations about what people have thought about justice. Yeah. And Aristotle, Plato, and Morocco. But it struck me that they are all male authority figures. I wonder if you've investigated at all what women throughout history have thought and said about justice. Sure, that's in other chapters. That's, this is just this one. Um, simply because in this particular one, um, you know, I'm, I, I think, I'm, you know, I'm just sort of tracing the idea of vengeance back to where it comes from, you know. I mean, and I think it is a kind of instinctual thing probably, um, but one that we're also trained to nurture. Um, but we all cite that eye for an eye, right? And we think it's biblical, but of course it's older than the Bible. Um, it goes back to this code. And we cite that, as I say, as a, as a sort of proof that like what I'm feeling is the right thing. Like this is the thing that must happen. It's, you know, it's been preordained. Um, but of course that particular um, phrase that we all use, eye for an eye, um, didn't mean uh, you have to do this. It meant don't do anything more than this, right? Don't, um, if, if he steals your cow, don't murder his entire family. Um, that it's just like one, one for another. And one of the things I realized actually in the process of this research was that that's at least partially the way that currency evolved was when um, wealthy people were, um, or people who had more stature in society, when they had harmed another, they would just give part of their wealth to that person rather than have the harm done back to them. And that money evolved as a, as a function of, you know, sort of redeeming the guilt of the person who had committed the crime. Um, and we see that still today, right? Um, where people who are wealthy are able to, they're treated differently by the justice system than people who are not. Um, people who have status are treated differently. It's almost like there's a different, an entire different concept of justice for people who have status and for people who don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you had never met this individual and this event had never occurred, how would you, how do you, where would your writing be? Uh, mm -hmm. Would you? I don't know. Sure, and I was just beginning to think of myself as a writer when this happened. You know, around the time that I met him was when I was starting to realize, oh, writing is a thing that people do. And maybe I can do it. I mean, I'm not quite so naive as that, but like, it's a thing that, that real people do, that, you know, there are people at this college where I'm studying who are getting their PhDs in creative writing. Who knew that was a thing? Um, you know, nobody in my family had a PhD in anything, much less creative writing. So it was, it had been revealed to me as a possibility and, and a path had been revealed as possible just around the time that I met him. And, and so then after um, our relationship was over and after he did this terrible violent thing, I had already been kind of put on a certain path, but obviously it was altered. And for many years until I finished writing The Other Side, that story of how that happened and what happened and and how I put an ending on it was always the one that I was trying to figure out how to tell. Um, and I started actually as a poet, my training is as a poet, and all my poems were kind of negotiating that. And then once I started writing essays, all the essays were kind of trying to tell the story. And after every time I would write something new, I would say, oh, whew, thank goodness, that's over. I don't have to write that story anymore. And then I would, you know, a few months later, get back and look at it and go, oh, like, I didn't actually say anything. 
um, I didn't even tell what happened. It's just, it was just that there's a sort of huge, enormous um, black hole of silence around, you know, the relationship, the violence, like um, one of the other essays in this current book, I say, you know, there's a, it's a crime that has no language and, um, or for which language fails. And so most of my then early career until I finished writing the other side was trying to find language to tell this story that seemed to resist it. Um, so it doesn't escape me that I would not be the writer I am today if that hadn't happened. Um, but I like to think maybe I would, I mean, I don't even sort of do hypotheticals. It's not, I don't find it useful for myself to go, well, you know, would I be writing novels? Would I be famous? Would I be living in New York? Um, because that's, that's sort of like that person doesn't even, that person doesn't exist. And, um, you know, the, there's no, as, as I've come to understand, you know, there's all this language around trauma that you're broken, you're shattered, your life has been shattered. Um, and that, um, the process of writing is a kind of recovery, which implies going back and putting everything back together again. But for me, there is no going back to that person I was before. That person is gone. There is no version of myself from here on out who is not a person who has been raped and kidnapped by someone she used to love, who has allowed, in some ways, a person to abuse her and then decided that I wasn't going to anymore. There's no version of myself that, for those for whom that has not happened. So I just have to live with the version of myself that I have. Yes. Um, before you had decided to put into writing, did you tell anybody about what happened? A few people. Um, it was, I write this in the other side, that it was always a kind of like initiation thing, like as you get to know a certain friend well enough, and you know, it seems like you guys are going to be BFFs now. Like there would always be wine. It's a requirement, I guess. Uh, not, I'm not mean to advocate drinking, um, but for myself, um, it's there was a pattern. You know, we'd go out for drinks, and and you know, you start telling all the dark stuff, and you go, oh well, you know, this is the thing that you know, I lost my my best friend when I was in middle school or something, and and then I would tell my thing, and then there was a kind of truncated version of it. It was like, well. You know, when I was 21, I was kidnapped and raped by this guy I used to live with. And there was always the same reaction. It was always, <gasps> I'm so sorry. Like, oh my God, that's terrible. And, um, and, and so that, but it was, a, it had kind of um, become plastic, you know, in the way that plastic is different from, oh wait, is that right? It had become static, that story. And um, the version that I told of it, even a slightly longer version, a, let's say a three-minute version rather than a 10-second version, was the same. it was a script that I had, that I had rehearsed. Um, and I write in the other side about when I finally decided to tell this story, I go and I collect. I know some of you have to go to class. I won't. Like, please go. Um, I mean, please don't go, but uh, I know you have to leave. Um, but, uh, but the version I had been telling had, had sort of without me realizing it had kind of shifted slightly over the years away from the facts of what happened. I mean, the, the major facts were still true, but there were things like in my memory, there's this um, male detective who I meet at the police station and I tell, he takes my statement and tells me the story. I have to go with him in the police car back to the house where it happened. So they like win and, dug around and made sure everything was true. And then he takes me you know, to the hospital and I meet people there. And when I looked at the police records, I found out that that male detective, and, and I still know that person um, who I associate with that memory. He said he's not a detective anymore, but I, I'm still in contact with him. Um, but the woman who took my story, who filled that spot in that memory was actually a female police officer. Um, and when I try to, make myself remember that instead, everything starts to get really wobbly. Like then it's, it's you know, like both, mem there's a, a fraction of a second where both memories can exist, but if I try to get the one that's real and not the one that's the story, then everything else starts to kind of wobble and fall apart. Um, 
so, um, but your original question was, did I tell people? Yes, sorry. I didn't come here to be brief, so. <laughs>